think we're live. Oh boy. Can you see us and hear us everyone? Please comment and tell us that you do. Can you feel the love tonight? Can you feel the love tonight? Why am I holding this bag of dogs? It says we have eight people, but no one's commented. Cinda said hi, but can you see us and hear us? Sarah Shannon says yes. Okay. All right. Terrific. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 51 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. And the best way to submit a question is through my website, www.eatunprocessed.com. People ask me all the time what Bailey eats. Sometimes she'll make a guest appearance on this broadcast. She eats something called V-Dog. It's vegetarian dog food, and you can get it at v-dog.com, and it actually just won the Veg News Award for Best Vegan Dog Food. And because she's a little pup, she they have these little tiny bites, really, really tiny, so that her little mouth can eat them. And this is the kibble she eats. So there you go. And thank you so much, Linda Middlesworth, for sponsoring this episode and sending me this bag of V-Dog. You can also get it in some stores depending on where you live. Website is v-dog.com. All righty. So first of all, I want to thank you and to apologize. I want to thank everyone who participated last week in episode 50, the big giveaway. It was so much fun. We did not realize how hard it was going to be and how hard it was going to be to fulfill these prizes, which we will, we promise. As you can see, I'm injured. I can't use my right hand. I can't use the left hand with the mouse, so I haven't been on the computer. I can text. I can do voice to text. And so please bear with us. So Eden is here today. She lives on the other side of the hill. And after the broadcast, she's going to go through the feed and fulfill the prizes. Some of you said you couldn't find her on Facebook to message her. So she's going to contact you. Some of you have tried to message me on Facebook. You can't do that, guys. I'm not on Facebook. I just have a professional page. So if you send me an instant message, a Facebook messenger, I think it's called. I don't have it, so I don't see it. So if you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, that's actually the best way to get in touch with me is on the boards because I give the Facebook group priority over my email, which I have checked in over a week now since my hand's been splinted and of course if you know me text me because or call me if you have my number that's actually even better so we will fulfill those prizes we promise and I wanted to show the instant pot to thank them so much they are such a generous company not only did they donate the grand prize but when I was uh, talking to them about this I had mentioned that about the fires in Santa Rosa that 1,500 people lost their homes and they said, oh, that's terrible. You know, we donated so many Instant Pots to the hurricane effort for people that, they didn't just donate to people that didn't have an Instant Pot. It was more like people that had an Instant Pot that lost their homes and lost their Instant Pot. And I said, well, two of your biggest fans, Dr. John and Mary McDougall and their daughter, Heather, who runs their program, had Instant Pots that were lost in the fire and Instant Pot replaced both of their Instant Pots. So if that's not another reason to support them at instantpot.com, and buy one of their pots if you use my code AJ ten dollars off or you can get it at Target and Walmart and Costco we can get them everywhere now but thank you so much to the instant pot company and for also donating the grand prize if you're following along with the 63 days of abstinence this is day nine of the 63 days of abstinence and what that is is those of us in ultimate weight loss we go from Halloween to January 2nd free of sofas, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt. Now, technically we're supposed to be free of those all year round, but we know it's not so easy for most people to do all the time. But we commit to the most difficult time of the year when people tend to relapse the most, gain the most weight, struggle the most with eating non-compliant foods. And so we make a commitment and we start on Halloween, which is a really big day for people to relapse with those fun size Snickers. And we go all the way through New Year's. So we're hitting Thanksgiving, we're hitting the religious holiday of choice if you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And if you can make it through those 63 days, the other 300 or however many days of the year will be easy. Now this is my 2317th day of abstinence. I missed one day in September of 2012. Shade, if you're watching, this is your 2307th day of abstinence. It gets easier, guys. You know, so many people uh, say it's too extreme, it's too hard. It's only if you're addicted because the truth is, is abstinence is easy. If you're not addicted to something, you know, if I told you go without okra for optimal health and weight loss, it wouldn't be a problem. It's only hard when you're addicted to these things. If you weren't addicted to them, it wouldn't be hard to go without alcohol or Diet Coke or coffee or sugar or oil or flour or salt. And what people don't understand until they actually embrace the concept of absence is that absence actually is bliss. And it's what makes weight loss, weight management, it makes it easy. It makes it sustainable. But until you do it, you probably don't know, you know. Anyway, that's what I wish you peace 
and abstinence brings peace, especially that calmness in the brain. So let's get started with the questions. But first, Do you want to mention your shirt? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eden, for remembering. So my shirt today is brought to you or brought to me by the Humane Project. That was the shirt I wore last week was from them, too, that said Vegan Badass, which had a hood. They make great. They design wonderful T-shirts. The website is humaneproject.com, and my code is Chef AJ can't remember if it's 10 or 15 percent but please support their efforts to get humane education out there and they make awesome awesome t-shirts really comfortable stylish ones as well thank you for saying that and where will i be tomorrow i'm leaving for hilton head south carolina there's still tickets left for the remedy food conference which goes from friday november 9th to sunday november 12th doug lyle will be there all kinds of wonderful plant-based doctors and athletes It'll be an Iron Chef uh, cooking competition that I'll be hosting. And then Monday, I'll be speaking at the Eat Smart Live Longer Club in Bluffton, South Carolina. Then on the 18th, I'll be at the Orange County Meetup where John Pierre will be speaking. And November 28th, I'll be teaching a hands-on holiday cooking class at Boulevard Kitchen in Sherman Oaks. My December 3rd class is sold out. And then I end the year True North, December 23rd to January 2nd, and I don't know if that is sold out or not. That's the holiday cooking extravaganza. But I will tell you, if you're anywhere in the South, you can buy one day passes to this conference I'll be at this weekend, and you can even buy meals separately or not at all. So I hope to see you there. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Danielle don't forget, wants- forget, sharing is caring. Share these broadcasts. <laughs> Danielle wants to know if you have any resources for healthy Thanksgiving meals. I just so happen to. So. Well, one resource, an oldie but a goodie, is my book on process. Now, you didn't say, Danielle, if you wanted it UWL compliant or just plant-based or just vegan, but there's a lot of great recipes in here for Thanksgiving. For example, the stuffed butternut squash is great for Thanksgiving. The five-minute cranberry relish, there's a dish with uh, sweet potatoes and pears and cranberries. So there's really good recipes in here for Thanksgiving. Lots of dessert recipes that regular people will eat. And you don't always have to go traditional with turkey type replacements. The lasagna on page 100, a lot of people make for Thanksgiving. So number one, my book on processed. Number two, you can go to my website, at, or excuse me, not my website. You could go to my website, but you can go to my YouTube page. And I have about 65 episodes of The Chef and the Dietitian that I did the last, last time we filmed was probably three years ago, but we have a holiday episode that's about 45 minutes long with all Thanksgiving recipes, and these are things I actually still make and make for company, so that's another free resource right there. You could take my cooking class if you live in Southern California, hands-on class on the 28th. I have a couple of webinars on my website, eatonprocess.com. I've got the, the free one, which is, I believe, it's called Plant-Based Dinner Party, and there's two with a slight fee, but they're perfect for entertaining. One is the Holiday Feast, and one is the Elegant Dinner Party. Both of those would be great. And I just got this wonderful ebook. It was one of the donated prizes last week by the Speedy Vegan, Pardon My Turkey. This, the book is beautiful with beautiful photographs and all these recipes are oil-free, whole food, plant-based. If there is no sugar, if there is minimal salt and maybe a couple of recipes and maybe minimal flour, but all these recipes can be compatible with Ultimate Weight Loss and many already are. And so this is a wonderful, wonderful book from The Speedy Vegan. And this would be great for all your holiday entertaining. The soups especially look fantastic to me. So that's what I recommend. And you know, it, 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 Thanksgiving is, is a day, so you know, food. I mean, it, I mean, I know that there's things that we love, traditional foods, but those foods I eat all year round. I mean, I eat sweet potatoes every day, so to eat sweet potatoes at Thanksgiving is not a big deal to me because that's that's what I eat every day. So thanks for the question and stay compliant. So someone emailed mm -hmm. and said, I wanted to know if you could recommend any stir fry sauce recipes that are UWL compliant and suitable to serve to quote regular yeah. people. You know, I don't, and I'm so sorry because generally stir fry sauces or generally Chinese Asian type sauces are sugar, fat, and salt, or at least sugar and salt. If you think about soy sauce or teriyaki sauce, it's it's a lot of salt. Sometimes there's sugar in it. You know, I think about what my favorite food was before I went SOS free, and that was pad thai. Well, why, you know, look, salt, sugar, and fat, you know, the fat from the peanuts and the tofu. And the oil. The, yeah, and the oil, the, flour, the noodles were flour, there was maple syrup or sugar in the sauce. So generally Asian sauces, they don't necessarily always have oil, but they 
pretty much always have sugar and salt and that's why you like them so much. I mean, I know there's a lot of wonderful vegan chefs like Del Roof that have stir fry sauces, but they're going to have some sugar and salt in them. So I'm sorry, I don't, I know, you know, I have my yummy sauce, I have my uh, ultimate sauce, which does taste a lot like peanut sauce without the peanuts. So that has sort of an Asian flair, but I really don't and I'm so sorry. The thing that's great about yummy sauce though is there's endless varieties. You have the base yummy sauce, but you can make it however you want. You can add ginger, you can add wasabi to make it more Asian, like you can add roasted red bell pepper, roasted roasted red bell pepper, roasted garlic. You could add um, smoked paprika, chipotle powder. So you can really use that sauce sort of as a template to make other sauces. I really don't, and I'm sorry, I and mean, if somebody could come up with some great SOS free sauces, man, you'd be a millionaire because that's what people really want. Okay, someone asked, why does eating temporarily alleviate anxiety and depression? Oh, you're not going to go to the ones that use all the props first, the, the cruise question? Mm. You can go back. It's just it's just because it's, it's more of like, because those are all more like mental questions, and this is just, I just wanted to get all these props out of the way. Oh, yeah, sorry. If you don't mind. Them. Sorry, we'll get back to your questions. Actually, those questions, by the way, that Eden is going to ask next were questions that were geared for Dr. Doug Lyle in the broadcast I did yesterday on emotional eating. If you didn't see it, I encourage you to watch it. It's controversial, but very good. And uh, these are questions from the people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Mastery Program. So again, I'm answering them not as Dr. Lyle, just my opinion. But this one, I've got a bunch of props here that I'd like to uh, show you. Okay, Mary asked, what is the best way to survive the holidays on a cruise ship? How do you keep your mindset strong? <laughs> it's kind of two questions. How do you keep your mindset strong? I'll, I'll get back to because I don't know the answer, what it's going to be for you. but. I think that somebody that's suffering from food addiction and wanting to lose weight, going on a cruise is as difficult as somebody that's trying to abstain from alcohol that goes on a wine tour in you know, Napa Valley. So I'm not, I, I don't wanna say it's a bad idea, but I mean, I've cruised four times now and I've done it successfully and I've actually lost weight every time I've cruised, but it's hard because I treat cruises like I do any outside eating event. And I have a free webinar, How to Eat Healthfully uh, When You Travel, which you can watch on YouTube, which gives some tips and tricks. But cruises, I think, are especially hard in many ways because it's harder to be in control of your food because you can't really cook in your cabin. Everywhere else that I go other than a cruise, even when I go to like a spa, I can bring my Instant Pot, I can bring my air fryer, and I can make things in my room if they don't have something suitable for me. Well, at least the ship that I was on said I couldn't bring my Instant Pot because it pulled too much energy or whatever. So I could not make anything. I either had to eat what they had or what they brought. I'm gonna show you what I do when I go on a cruise, what I've done in the past. But the problem is, is that for me, cruising is like going to restaurants and I find it very disappointing because the whole thing about cruise is about decadence and about extravagant, hyper palatable food in quantities, egregious quantities, all hours of the day and night it, and you know midnight buffets and it, extravagance and the thing is is while I enjoy eating simply at home and I do I really do guys I'm not making this up I love my steamed vegetables I love my brown rice I love my fruit and I'm very happy with the way I eat but when I go and see everything else then I start thinking I don't really feel deprived but I, my brain goes well gosh why do they get to have that why can't I have that and that's all I'm seeing again you know your environment is the number one predictor of your success and if all you're looking at is extravagant buffets with chocolate fountains and pastries and they don't just have one kind I mean I mean that pastry uh, buffet at the cruise it's like I mean it's like literally every kind of candies cakes cookies pies or ice cream you can imagine every kind of bread every kind well you know not if, if you're somebody that eats meat you know every they have every kind of everything and it's literally available 24 hours a day and I, of course you could probably avoid the buffets by eating at the dining room and there's ways to navigate a cruise successfully. You're in UWL, Mary, so I, I'll tell you their last names. Jo I don't want to put their names on the board or on this broadcast, but Joanna and George have successfully navigated many cruises. Joanna did a Disney cruise for her, I believe, 50th wedding anniversary or one of her wedding anniversaries. I don't think she's that old. Sorry about that. Not 50th. And, and she posted a lot about that on the boards. You can look in the search files, how she called in advance and talked to the chef and he created a menu. You know, the more you pay, the more they're willing to do for you. I find that when, when I get on the cruise, the first thing I do is I have a $20 bill in my hand and I shake the hand of the maitre d' and then I find out who my head waiter is and I do the same thing and I say there's more where that came from if you take care of me. But they can only take care of you to the extent of what they have on the ship. 
the ship I was on, you know, there weren't a lot of greens, if there were any. I never saw greens. I was able to get some vegetables and some steamed vegetables. But the problem is, is a lot of times it still came with oil and butter, even though we said no oil and butter, and it always tasted real salty. And I think the reason is, and this is what I talked to the, the chef on the ship, is like they don't waste anything on a cruise. So if they've got this big pot of boiling water where they're either boiling their pasta or steaming their vegetables, there's going to be salt in it. And there's probably going to be oil in it too. And they're not going to throw it out and start a new one for you just because you can't have salt or oil. So I it's harder to get truly compliant food. Like I was able to get white rice at every meal, which, you know, it's fine. I'll eat white rice. It's tasty since I don't eat it that often. But after, you know, eight days, it got a little bit boring. I didn't see any brown rice. I was always able to get salad vegetables, but it was sparse, the salad bar. It was generally cucumber, tomato, onion, and and lettuce. You can be uh, creative at times when the salad bar was closed. What I did was I went to, they had a sandwich station that was like open 24 hours a day. And I would go to the sandwich station and they'd say, what kind of bread, what kind of meat? I go, no bread, no meat. And they'd give me a plate of cucumbers, tomatoes, red onion, and, uh, and cucumbers. And I'd build my own salad. But I always brought stuff with me to supplement. And I always made sure I bought some condiments and some starch. Because fruits and vegetables, you should be able to get on the cruise. And you should be able to at least, if, if you can't get them cooked without salt and oil, you should at least be able to get them raw. So uh, one of the things I always bring on the cruise are my condiments. So I always make sure I have a bottle of the salt-free mustard and that can make things with that or make things that I get taste better. Always have a bottle of Brew Brew Brothers hot sauce. This is the only SOS free hot sauce I've ever seen. You can get it at Whole Foods and online. It's very hot. It just, I mean, this bottle will last me a very long time. And I'll bring a bottle of my favorite salt-free seasoning, Benson's Table Tasty. So I'll have my condiments there. Always have at least a bottle at least one bottle of my favorite vinegar. And my new favorite is basil. If you guys haven't Ooh. tried Bimon Paz basil, you can see I, it's already half gone. The, uh, she generously donated many prizes last year. So I always take at least uh, probably two of these bottles to last me for the whole cruise. She's also got a new holiday flavor, pumpkin pie spice. So wow. I always have vinegar. Or, you know, if you want to get, take Napa Valley Naturals, that's fine, but I always take that with me. And then one of the things I also take is a bag of snacks. And I'll show you my little snack bag in a second, but I also want you to know that there usually is a refrigerator in your cabin. And that refrigerator is filled with crap, like small bottles of alcohol and maybe Coke and some peanuts and things like that. And so they do that because then they can charge you. And so when I've, I've said, you know, um, I need this food removed, oh no, we can't do that. The, I, I don't know what he's called, but not, um, the cabin, the person that services your cabin. And I said, well, I'm a food addict and I'm an alcoholic. You need to take this food out. And he did. And guess what happened? Then I had a whole fridge. And so what I did is I have this uh, little eight cup Tupperware bowl that's purple. I could get it if you want. And so when I saw things that I could eat, then I would take more of it and I refrigerate it and then I would have that with me. And I'd also bring my Milot muffins that you can get in the cooking party number one, one for every day. So I'd have enough starch and I would put those, I would freeze them and I would put those in the refrigerator. And the other thing I would bring, because one of the problems is, is I think that if you are vocal enough and stand your ground, you can get compliant food on a cruise and as much as you want. But the excursions are going to be tough because it's hard enough getting vegan food on an excursion in a foreign country, let alone SOS free vegan food. So I would bring these little cartons. I don't have one to show you. They're called Umpqua Oats, U-M-P-Q-U-A. They have one brand called Not Guilty that has no sweetener, no salt. And all I'd have to do is add some boiling water and maybe a banana. So I would take those on excursions. But when I travel, and I have this ready because I'm traveling tomorrow, I'll be gone five days, is I have a bag of snacks. And it's kind of fun because I don't eat these except for when I travel. So one of the things I'll have, is I'll bring the beet chips from Trader Joe's. So these are great, because I don't eat these every day, but I, I have them when I travel. And then the other thing I'll bring are the dried bananas. These are called Barnana. This is the apple flavor, but I'll bring these because these don't need refrigeration. And one of the, my favorite things to bring are, these are my starch cookies. And you can get this on the, I think it's the elegant dinner party webinar. So what these are is these look like cookies and they smell like cookies and Dr. Goldhammer actually eats these, but these are actually made of starch. So these are made out of sweet potatoes and oats primarily. There's no dates, the sweetener is, is whole fruit 
and I dehydrate these till super crunchy. So these last for months and I take three or four for every day I'm away because I find it's the starch that's the problem. I can't always get my potatoes, my sweet potatoes, and you know I do tend to get a little bit sick of white rice. So I take my starch cookies and I, like I said, all these things in the snack bag, I only eat them when I travel. So uh, I just make sure that I have enough food because I don't ever want to be in a situation where I don't. So good luck. Uh, the other thing I recommend on a cruise, and this advice was given to me by my partner in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, John Pierre, is that when I'm outside of my comfort zone, my home, I actually tighten the screws on my program rather than loosen them. So most people use outside eating events, birthdays, anniversaries, other people's homes, restaurants, cruises as an excuse to go off plan. I use that as an opportunity to be even stricter. So I'll be even stricter with my food when I'm traveling and I'll even up my exercise more because I mean, my roommate on the cruise gained eight pounds. I lost every year on the cruise, I lost three pounds because I was so diligent. Because you're in an environment of, of just a, a, a opulence, extravagance, and depravity, if you, if you will. Very, very hard environment for somebody that struggles with weight or food addiction to be in. Um, so, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the question. Mm -hmm, sure. Why does eating temporarily alleviate anxiety and depression? Yeah, well, well here's the thing. Anything il temporarily alleviates anxiety and depression. So the reason eating alleviates it temporarily is because it's a distraction from the anxiety and depression. But guess what? If you would just go for a walk or go for a run or go spinning or do a puzzle or do anything, you could temporarily, the, the key word here is temporarily, alleviate it. It, it, eats, it relieves it because it, it's changing your state, it's a distraction, you're supplying your brain with some dopamine, some feel good chemicals, but you could do the same thing with exercise. You could probably have sex, you could probably take a bubble bath or get a massage. So I don't think it's so much that it's eating that's the thing, it's that you're, you're doing something, you're doing an activity, and you're distracting yourself from what you're feeling. In this case, you're numbing yourself, but there's other ways to numb yourself in a more healthy manner or to get those feel good brain chemicals or do something else. If you had a craft you really loved, if you had a puzzle or something else to occupy your brain, you can't you you could distract yourself as well. So, you know, they say that exercise is the most underutilized antidepressant and anti-anxiety medicine in the world. And anybody that is still anxious and depressed on this program eating this way, my first question is, are you getting enough sleep and are are you still using things like stimulants like caffeine or possibly depressants like alcohol, but are you exercising, you know? Dr. Lyle has taught me that for me, you know, it's been tough with his hand, but I finally was able to go back to spin class today and just kind of, you know, go like this on the bike. Because for me, it, I am an anxious person and I've had anxiety disorders like panic disorder. It's a non-negotiable. I didn't exercise to lose weight. I lost almost all my weight, 47 of the 50 pounds without exercise, but that is my antidepressant. And so if you are somebody that leans towards anxiety and depression, that has to be your prescription that every morning you get at least an hour of some kind of really vigorous exercise. And then do that consistently and then see if you're really still anxious and depressed. I bet you it will be helped greatly by that. Um, Christina's asking about the starch cookie recipe. Christina, she mentioned already that it's on a yeah, webinar. Yeah, it's on, on eatonprocess.com. Go to my webinar page and it's at elegant holiday, it's the elegant party recipes and it's called, on the, on the website or on the webinar page it's called, I believe I call it pumpkin pie bites and I actually have a frosting that I make that goes with it. I'm, I don't take the frosting when I travel but I do make a vanilla frosting so you can make a sandwich cream cookie. They're really good. They're the only ones Goldhammer eats actually. But yet when I give them to my husband or, or Dr. Lyle, they, they're not sweet enough for them. So they're not super sweet. They're more starchy but mm -hmm. they're very, very filling and that's what I like about them for travel. Yeah, they're great for on a plane too. Mm -hmm. And they're super crunchy if you like crunchy. Okay. What would be a good way to stop and realize that you are about to emotionally eat? Yeah, so, well, the first thing I would do is ask yourself these three questions. And these questions I got, I have this on my fridge, and I, I don't know if you can see that, but we can hold up the piece of paper right like that. Yep. So you can take a screenshot. So there's a program, and again, you know, if you saw yesterday's episode with Dr. Lyle, he doesn't think emotional eating, well, I don't know if he said, doesn't think it's real, he doesn't think it's the reason people are struggling or overweight, but I took a wonderful course called the Shrink Yourself program at shrinkyourself.com, 
and it was like $40. I've done it twice and it really helped me with the last bit of what I called emotional eating. And one of the questions, it's, it's a great interactive online program. You can do like an hour a week for 12 weeks and it, 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 you can get these printouts and it really helps you figure out what your triggers and cues are and what you need to do for yourself to get this to get a handle on this he also has a book by the same name with lots of exercises in it and it's called shrink yourself by dr roger gould I, I found a lot of value in the program and one of the things i learned is that if i was going to eat outside of hunger is to ask myself these three questions first which is why do i want to eat this right now how will this make me feel better and how can i address this problem without food and so one of the things that i recommend to people if they're going to eat something outside of hunger is first of all ask yourself are you you know what are you really hungry for because a lot of times it's not food it's love it's connection it's understanding so ask you know check in what am I really hungry for and the way I know or I think other people could know as well whether they're eating for hunger or for emotional reasons is what are you eating because if it's eight o'clock at night and you're starving for steamed kale you're probably hungry or even maybe a potato but if it's potato chips or kale chips, it's probably not because the truth is, is any actual whole food or any food with nutrient value will satisfy hunger. But if it's cravings or emotional hunger or food addiction, it has to be a specific food. And so you kind of know if you're eating emotionally based on what your food choices are. I mean, there are certain gray areas because certain things like oatmeal, for example, with fruit, I think people can eat outside of hunger. I think banana banana ice cream you could eat outside of hunger but for the most part ask yourself you know first of all when is it happening and ask yourself am i really hungry and the truth is is if we could all just learn to eat within the confines of true hunger and stop when full we wouldn't be overweight regardless of what we're eating but the problem is is we're including so many chemicals in our food on a daily basis like the sugars real and fake and the diet cokes and the oils and the flours and the alcohol and the salt that these perpetuate hunger, these drive hunger, these, these drive food cravings. And when you get these out of your diet, it is so much easier to not to have this calm, stable brain so that you can enjoy the whole natural food. And then if you want to eat emotionally and chew on some celery or chew on some carrots, knock yourself out. It's not going to hurt you. But it's generally the food you choose. And, you know, that's, what was the question again? I'm just like talking. I'm, I'm so <laughs> tired today. I'm so um, sorry. What would be a good way to stop and realize that you yeah. are about to emotionally yeah. eat? Well, just stop. I mean, just just stop. Like, take a, do what Dr. Gould calls, take a pause. Sit down, take some deep breaths and say, what, what's going on here? What am I feeling? If you're journaling, that would be the time to journal. If you're keeping the food mood journal like I recommend, that would be great. Because it generally, there's something going on that you want to distract yourself from. So get in touch with what's really going on with you. That's when you get on the Facebook group and say, hey guys, you know, I'm having a craving for X, Y, Z. What's going on here? But, you know, you stop yourself the same way you temporarily alleviate the anxiety or depression. You distract yourself by doing something else other than eating. And the thing is, is there's, you could, you could come up with a list right now, I bet, of a hundred things you can do other than eat emotionally. I mean, you could call a friend, you could go for a walk, you could pet your dog, you could brush your dog, you could watch TV, you could watch a YouTube with Dr. Doug Lau, you could take a book, I mean, you could, you could polish your nails, you could knit a sweater. So there's so many other ways to distract yourself. You know, exercise is one of the best ways because then you get those endorphins going and those good brain chemicals. And even if you live somewhere where it's not safe to walk at night or the weather, you know, you can march in place, you can do some jumping jacks, you can do something to change your state. But generally, that's what you need to do. Nice. We have over 200 people now. Nice. Sorry, I'm a little tired today. I got up at 4.30 today because I have to be up at 3 tomorrow for my flight, and so a little bit sleepy today. Okay. Why do we sometimes stay compliant with our food plan through a stressful situation, a holiday gathering, or a vacation, but mm -hmm. after said event... We have the desire to eat outside of hunger or we have cravings for non-compliant foods. I think that's because you've been with so much non-compliant food on these vacations like the cruise. Mm -hmm. I think you can white knuckle it when you're in the situation. It's sort of like, give you a couple of analogies, like, um, you know, people that are first responders, like police officers or paramedics, they, you know, they'll be at an accident scene. People have been shot or, or harmed or mutilated in some ways, like a car accident. It's pretty gruesome. 
And could you imagine if they went up to this, these scenes and goes, oh my God, you're bleeding. You know, they, they, I mean, they freak the people out they're trying to minister for, but that doesn't mean that they're not affected by it. And because I know, because I work, I mean, I volunteer at a hospital that's also a trauma center, and I often talk to the police officers and the paramedics. They don't show it. Like, for instance, like, I mean, how effective would you be if you were a firefighter and, like, you know, you're crying while you're trying to help somebody? That doesn't mean they don't have feelings and emotions, and a lot of them often have to have therapy and counseling. They're been, I don't want to mention what these are, but there have been a couple of cases that I know about that were so horrific that they were able to do their job and help the person, but they were so traumatized and had PTSD by the things they saw. So, so it's sort of like when you're in the situation, you can use your willpower and all your skills and your green powders and essential oils and, and, and your vision boards and, 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 and get through it. But that doesn't mean that having that stuff around for however many days you were on vacation, seeing it, smelling it, watching other people mm and on, ah, eat and enjoy, it doesn't affect you. It's sort of like, have you ever seen a priest in a strip club? And I know I'm not being facetious, but I actually went to Spearmint Rhino. And that's a, a, a full nude strip club in Los Angeles. And I did that for research. And that may sound odd, but when I was writing my book, you know, one of the things, if somebody is overweight or obese, I don't have to ask them what they eat, whether they're vegan or not. I already know they're not eating any fruits and vegetables, or they are very, very little. As we know from the study of Tufts, the more servings of vegetables and fruits you eat, the lower your body weight and BMI. So I already know if somebody's overweight or obese, I already know what they're eating. But I wanted to study people that were thin and ask them what they were eating. And Dr. Lyle had said yesterday that most people are thin, are thin just for genetics. And that's, and they can eat the same crap as everybody else and they'll never get overweight. And um, and we know that's to be true because there was a wonderful documentary done a while back, and I don't know if it's still on YouTube. It was done on the BBC, and it was called Why Thin People Can't Get Fat. And they took these young college-age students, and they literally, in for 30 days, they force-fed them something like 20,000 calories, which was really hard to do. Maybe it was 10,000. And they literally had to melt down ice cream, and they were choking it. It was so hard for these people to eat this many calories. And they basically did not gain weight. And they used these things that they use for astronauts when astronauts come back to the Earth to measure their bone density. And the, the point of the documentary was these people that are genetically naturally thin, and I think that has to do with that APOE5 gene or whatever, no matter what they did, they couldn't get them to, to gain weight. And, um, but there are people that, like me, that are not naturally genetically thin, that actually have to use discipline and lifestyle to, to remain thin. And so when I started working with people on weight loss and I was starting to get people that were like actresses and models that were already thin but needed to be thinner, I would ask them like, you know, what their lifestyle was and things like that. And what was interesting, is a lot of times we think people, oh, they're just, you know, they're models, they're just genetically blessed. And that's not always true. You know, maybe somebody that's 20 and thin, that, that's true. And models are genetically blessed in that they're tall, generally, and they usually have really good cheekbones. But as I got to know some of these women, it was like they were still doing something. It wasn't like they were just sitting around eating bonbons and Cheetos all day. They maybe weren't vegan, but they were doing something to be thin. They were exercising on a regular basis. They were watching what they ate, maybe not the same diet I recommended. So so just to think that everybody just sits around and eats a bunch of crap and that's why they're thin, maybe there are some people. But for the most part, at least for women, it doesn't necessarily seem to be true. So I was just curious what these girls that like literally had to be naked all shift had these like beautiful bodies. And yes, they were in their 20s, some in their 30s, what they ate. And, I, and so I went there and it was like three bucks because I got there before six o'clock and it was kind of an interesting experience. Went with a bunch of girlfriends and our chaperone, Tim, and I basically asked them what they ate and what they exercised, their exercise patterns were, and they all were doing something. They weren't, they, well, first of all, they all were going to the gym every morning. That was for sure. All of them did because they were dancers. They were very athletic. They were working the pole and they were all on some kind of dietary style. Unfortunately, most of it was more of a paleo thing, egg whites and vegetables, but they were eating vegetables for breakfast, by the way. So I bring that up. Why? Because when I was in the strip club, I didn't see any priests in there. And I mean that because priests take a vow of celibacy. And if you took a vow of celibacy, that would probably be the worst place for you to be. So they don't expose themselves to that. And it's the same thing. I'm not the saying that you have to take a vow of abstinence to be in the ultimate weight loss program, but it's almost kind of like that if you put yourself in a situation where it's easy to relapse, even if you don't relapse in that situation, it lingers because you're going to think about it all mm -hmm. the time. Because if you're on vacation and you're, you know, let's say you're a three meal a day or you're with people that eat three meals a day and every single meal that everybody else is eating is non-compliant, 
you you get um you start it starts to wear out down your resolve like water on a rock and you start thinking well why can't I have it why can't I have a little boy that looks good and it does that to you and so while you may be able to be strong while you're on your vacation or while you're at the restaurant or the dinner party you and mainly because you're with other people and usually people know your dietary style so for me I was lucky the one time I relapsed in the last six years I did it I failed boldly in front of people and miserably and was very embarrassed but for the most part food addiction is a disease that exists in isolation and if people are going to binge or overeat or eat something off plan they generally don't do it in front of people so I think what happens is it's just knocking on your door saying hey remember me I, you used to eat me don't you remember I'm chips and guacamole you used to love me why don't you eat me anymore please please and so what happens is is it, it's it's like you can't take it anymore and so the minute you get home that's all you've seen and that's that's what I think happens personally it's exposure mm -hmm. you know I took a college course on the addicted brain and and the professor talked about how these visual cues in our environment are so powerful but you're not just having visual cues like when you go to a movie and they have the commercial for the coke and the popcorn you're having olfactory cues mm -hmm. you're having auditory cues I mean you know I had one client who just the, the sound of her husband eating popcorn or eating you know cereal just drove her nuts so I think what happens is it's the environment and so that's why I don't put myself in non-compliant environments even if that means staying home alone on Thanksgiving which I think we actually have a question about Thanksgiving don't we yeah um, Trudy asked about how to deal with mm -hmm. non-vegan family members she has a vegan household and vegan children and she has family members who won't even come to her house if she's not feeding slaughtered animals yeah. and slaughtered so animals. So she's secretions. vegan and her family's vegan, but not her other family. The immediate family is the, vegan. The household is vegan. Got it. Okay. Well, we actually had a, have a situation like this in the mastery group right now where somebody has this, or maybe it's in the main group, that somebody has this situation where they're a family of ethical vegans and the the mother will not come unless there's a dead bird and that hurts the person's feelings but she's standing her ground so how do you deal with it oh and I didn't answer I didn't answer the second part of the cruise question the mindset remind me to go back to that okay how do you deal with it I don't know how you deal with it it's it, because it's hard it's hard because these the social part of this process of trying to get healthy is the hardest part and it's the part where people tend to give up um, it, it, unless you're somebody that's extremely uh, introverted and not people pleasing and not open to experience for the most part this is where people I don't want to say relapse but let let it go and, and let things go because it's they want to be included they want to be part of a group and it's hard especially at the holidays and lots of emotion it's a special time of year and and they, there's just all these extra stresses and just ex expectations so how you deal with it is going to be up to you but I admire people that do stand their ground ethically for whatever they believe in because you know if you give in I mean once you give in whatever that is people never take you seriously so if you I personally do not let dead animals come into my house the same way I don't let alcohol or smoking come into my house I don't drink and I don't smoke so you know if you want to drink and smoke there's a patio right there you I mean I guess I, I wouldn't even want it that close to me you know I had an uncle that wouldn't come to my mom's 80th birthday because I wasn't going to serve alcohol mainly because that's more was going to be more expensive than the dinner to serve it but you know I think it's their choice I mean I was surprised that the mother wouldn't come because I know my mother would do anything to be with her children and grandchildren and you know it's one meal out of you know a thousand meals a year and if I think if somebody cannot go one meal without their addiction that's really really sad mm -hmm. uh, so um, you know how you deal I don't know how do you deal with it I call dr. Doug Lyle and have a session that's how I deal with all my emotional stuff it, it's hard you know you could compromise your ethics and let them bring it in but that I, I, that's not a great solution what I might recommend is doing something else you know saying to these people well um, can we can I come over for dessert or can you come over for dessert or or having them come later or you going later or saying hey can we meet at 12 o'clock and take a hike as a family can we do something else that doesn't involve centered around a tortured animal I respect people that that live their ethics like I was just talking to Linda Middlesworth to thank her for the v-dog and I said what are you doing Thanksgiving she's not going anywhere because her daughter serves slaughtered animals and she doesn't want to do it and she hasn't gone for years 
and I'm the same way. I, you know, especially after 40 years being vegan, it's just, it's really sickening and nauseating to be around that. It's one thing being around non-compliant food like flour and sugar, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really, really hard. And I don't really have the answer as to what is right for you, but I think that you know in your heart what your ethics are and you have to go with what that is because you can never go wrong if you, if you follow your heart. And you can always plan to see people a different day. It's just one day. It's just one meal. You know, what I always did to escape the holidays, I mean, now I escape them by going to True North, but when I was younger, I did not want to be around dead animals. And so, and I, I volunteered at the Los Angeles Missions, Mission and feed, fed the homeless. And I still was around some dead animals because they fed them turkey, but I was on the corn, meaning like I scooped corn and I was what they call the table captain and I cleaned the table. So that's what I did most of my life on Thanksgiving so that I could avoid the whole family craziness and dysfunction and dynamic and mm -hmm. that food. I can't really answer what's right for you. I know it's a difficult problem for people. The holidays are so stressful, which is why we're doing the 63 days of absence because it's even more important for us to have this calm, stable brain. It's not about trying to lose weight through the holidays. It's trying to really just not gain weight and just to just to stay calm. Tough one and I don't, I don't have the answer for you. I just see the people in another way, another time. Not everything has to be focused around food, guys. It really, you can make new traditions. Play Scrabble, you know, do a puzzle. Uh, have them come afterwards, you know. Having it at your house, I think, is the home court advantage because I think people have to respect that. Uh, I don't expect people to have my kind of food when I, well, I don't go to people's houses anymore, but I bring my food everywhere, even to restaurants, even to other people's houses. If they don't like it, I don't have to go. It's really okay. I'm okay being alone because I'd rather be alone and sane than crazy, sick, and fat just to be with somebody else. Right, exactly. Like, that's just me. <laughs> All right. So here's our next question. Anybody there have any questions? Um, someone please said... Please share this broadcast. <laughs> someone said, it's after everyone leaves that usually gets to me. Mm -hmm. The stress, both good and bad stress is over and I'm tired and in the past I have used the excuse I deserve to comfort myself with food. Can you say halt? I have I will have my oils and I will have compliant foods at my house. Okay, I'm swaying back and forth because Eden is swaying back and forth. So stop <laughs> swaying back and forth. Sorry. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Um, and but sometimes gatherings are not at my house. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Well, I think that's very similar to the vacation question. I think you know, I mean, your brain tells you self, self, you deserve this treat, I'm guessing. I mean, my brain has never told me that, but I think, what do you consider a treat? Because if you can reframe the fact that having a slender body that you've always dreamed of and having a calm, stable brain, if you think about that as the treat, you've already won. This is, you, you, if that's what you deserve. D deserving some crap food because you had stress, that's just, not the way I would I would look at it. So it, what you deserve is to be healthy and to have the body of your dreams that you deserve and think about it that way. So, and, and I don't know what you mean by good stress because I mean, I don't, I don't like it. You know, Dr. Goldhammer says stress is like Christmas, better to give than to receive. So instead of thinking about what treat you can have because you've had stress, think about ways you can mitigate the stress so that you don't need to, comp that you don't need to reward yourself with those treats or, or design other treats like we call them non, non, non uh, rewards you know non non scale victories or something like that I yeah rewards it, yeah non food rewards in other words so if you've had stress sure you deserve something to feel better so that's when you treat yourself to a spa manicure or pedicure or a wrap or an exfoliation or so yeah I'm all for people having rewards and treats but just non food rewards is what I'm saying so yes you do deserve it you absolutely deserve but what you deserve more than eating some kind of crap food because you just saw it at a party and you were able to abstain at the party is you deserve the calm stable brain and the slender body that you say that you want so I would reframe it that way the slender body is the treat then you don't miss the treat you are the treat nice what is the more efficient way to train my brain to switch from food addiction to gym addiction? Well, I don't know how you train your brain. I do know, I'm, well actually there are ways to train your brain as a matter of fact. There's these wonderful, um, I'm not much for having people play mindless games on their phone, but believe it or not, there are some great brain training games on your phone as far as you want to talk about training your brain. Like there's one called 
Lumosity or Luminosity that has wonderful things that, that do that for you. And there's there's things like, uh, there's one called wor, wor, Wood Puzzle. There's certain ones that really are really for your brain that, that, that are excellent. They're not just like mindless uh, games. So these are like, they're calling brain training games. There's a, brain games is, is one of them, I believe. So that's one thing. But to, to go from food addiction to gym addiction is, is to create new habits built around exercise. And you know, I've heard it said that we never really overcome our addictions. We just trade one for another and exercise is a way better addiction, I think, than food or alcohol. And so you get into the habit of exercising. Now, I, I don't know how you can do it. I can tell you how I did it, but let me just tell you why exercise is so important for people with addictions because it's the only thing that has been proven to actually help people prevent people from having an addiction in the first place and to rewire the brain to help people overcome an addiction. And that has nothing to do with diet. And you can find this in the medical literature, how powerful exercise is. And that's why when you talk about stress and eating for anxiety or depression, use exercise first before you do drugs. Exercise is a drug if it's used appropriately. And it will give you all those feel good chemicals that will actually make you stick to your healthy eating plan and regardless of what weight you are, it will make you feel better, it will make you look better, make you look longer and leaner, whatever weight you are, and when done first thing in the morning especially, increases your self-esteem, which is what losing weight does, but takes a little bit longer for the weight to come off, whereas exercise, the effects are absolutely immediately. So you need to establish a plan of, of movement. Like I love how JP teaches people to move throughout the day and have little stations with your bands, and your, um, uh, and your uh, weights and things like that, but find something that you like to do. What did you like to do when you're seven? When you were seven, did you like to swim? Did you like to ride your bike? Did you like to dance? Hopefully the answer isn't nothing, but find what you like to do when you were little and do that now because if there's a class for it, it's great because sometimes being in a class is more motivating than trying to do it yourself. So if you like running, join go to meetup.com or join a running group like Shada started playing pickleball through meetup.com find a, an activity that you like in doing it in a group unless you're a very highly introverted person that's so disciplined that you can exercise yourself which I'm at that point now I still spin three 90 minute classes a week but I do it myself nobody's in the room I don't need that but to start out I needed the energy of the people in the room to get me through the class and the and the coaching from the instructor. I'm not I'm able to do it now, but this is five years later. So what I did to start exercising is I got a buddy. You know, having a buddy for when you're wanting to make lifestyle change, whether it's to quit smoking or quit drinking or start exercising or eating healthfully, having a buddy, Dr. Michael Royzen from the Cleveland Clinic says has been proven more effective than the most effective anti-addictive medicine. There's something magical about having a buddy or what we call an accountability partner. It doesn't have to be a live, well, I mean, it has to be a live person. It doesn't have to be an in-person person. It can be an online person, but where exercise is concerned, a live person is great because when I started exercising, I used to go to a class called Cardio Bar with my friend Melanie, and I committed to a time and to pick her up just like I would if I have a dentist appointment, which fortunately I have next week. And so I wasn't gonna let Melanie down. And so by having a buddy, I was able to exercise and we used to walk together. But then once I got bit by the exercise bug and found out what it did for me mentally, which really was to calm me down and make me feel good and make, make the food part so much easier, I didn't, it's not that I don't enjoy doing things with other people, but I didn't need it anymore. And it really, it became a habit. And when you do something long enough, it not only becomes a habit, but an automatic habit. But getting started is the hardest, hardest part. If you read the book, The Pleasure Trap, which I recommend, the motivational triad is seek energy, uh, seek pleasure, avoid pain, and conserve energy. And boy, avoiding exercises, you, you conserve energy and you avoid pain. And it'll be, sometimes it is painful at first if you've had a lifetime of inactivity. I just went a week without exercise because this thing was so acute, I was in too much pain and I was on narcotics. And I'll tell you, going back today, 5.30 in the morning, it was it's so hard to get back to. That's why, just like with the food, when you relapse, it takes so many days to get the food right and to get it to taste good again. When you relapse on exercise, even when you have a medical uh, exception, it's so much hard to get back to it. So I play little tricks on myself. I would sign up for a spin class, it was $18. That was before I joined a gym where it's much cheaper. And if you didn't cancel by a certain time, you lost the money. 
and I would sleep in my workout clothes, not my shoes, and uh, except for my shoes, and I, you know, I, I, I just did it. It's, I mean, it's kind of like what my shirt says. That's kind of like you just do it. You build a habit. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And if you hate all forms of exercise, do the one you hate the least. And for me, that was yoga. That's where I started, and now I love it. I mean, I can't imagine not exercising now. It's almost like if I, if I'm not allowed to exercise. I go crazy. It's because my brain is so dependent on on those chemicals because I'm not getting them from sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, or salt. So, yeah. Uh, I, uh, can I get back to the mindset question that that Mary had about the cruise? Yeah. How do you? You know, that's all. I'm not a psychologist. This is all more like JP and Doug Lyle stuff. But I think if you know what your goals are, I think that helps your mindset. You know why you're doing this because it's easy to get distracted when you're on a cruise and see all these buffets and you forget what your if you just know what your long-term goal which is I think for a lot of us optimum health and longevity to live a life without disease and debility and then maybe your short-term goal to get to a certain weight maybe for an event like your daughter's wedding or whatever but I think having goals and having them somewhere where you can remember them having that vision board mindset is uh, you know, are you meditating every day? Are you reminding yourself of your goals every day? Um, journaling, I mean, I have this book that Heather Goodwin gave me. It's 52 um, weeks where you list, and Natalie gave me another journal. So I think it's great when you have goals, but mindset is, uh, it's one of the, I think the mind is the hardest thing to master. I think the diet, the eating part, is the easiest part. Okay. Um, Someone asked, if it's not emotional eating, then what is triggering it? How do we change our response to it? This must be a Dr. Lyle. Yeah, that's a Dr. Lyle. But, um, well, you know, um, I'm, gonna con I'm gonna agree with what Dr. Lyle said yesterday is that it's because there's rich food in the environment. Right. Because that's what is driving people to relapse to eat is because their environment is still not cleaned up. They cannot, they say they cannot, but I think that they will not clean up their environment so they're always exposed to these hyper palatable foods and he explained yesterday that we're designed to eat the richest food in their environment and as long as there's rich food in the environment we know it and we are driven to eat it and so not to say that there's not emotional stuff going on but there's people all over the world in ravaged war-torn countries that have all the same kind of trauma and drama and emotions that we have that are not overweight and that are not eating when gunfire is happening so because they don't have anything but beans and rice. So again, I really do think if you guys would for once really clean up your environment, you'll see how much easier this is. As long as there's rich food, as long as there's some sugar and oil and flour and alcohol and salt, you know, the people that are successful on the program do the program as designed and they, they stay abstinent of these chemicals. And the ones that are always struggling, well, you know, I only have a quarter teaspoon of salt a day. I only have you know, one slice of avocado, well, that might be enough to make it so that you really can't neuroadapt to the kind of food that we recommend you eat. Do the program 100% just once for like, like 21 days. And I know some people say they can't even go one day without sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt. That's how you know it's an addiction. And then you might need to go to True North and fast. Any questions from the phone or? Um, yeah, but I'll, I would have to scroll up a lot. You can scroll up. You can scroll. I mean, you don't have to. I can't see it. So sometimes we do a different technology called Be Live, where I can read it as we go along. But people seem to like this one better. Okay. Um, under stress, why does our brain say I deserve this we and go for that. something off plan with a vengeance? Didn't, isn't that similar nope. to what we just said? Well, it's similar. It's a different question. Yeah, I, you, I, you don't have to. Yeah, answer. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if everybody's brain really does that. I think because there's rich food in the environment, either in your house or you just saw it on vacation at a restaurant on a cruise. You know, I mean, I don't think that. I think if you go to True North where there's no rich food in the environment. Even if you were to get stressed there, which, I mean, I don't know how you would get stressed. Maybe the phlebotomist poked the wrong vein or something. I don't think you would be driven to overeat because there's nothing there that you could hurt yourself on. Raw salad, that's about it, 24 hours a day. Okay, so Louise, this question's coming from her. Every little breeze, um, whisper Louise. <laughs> She said, how do we make people care? I have many family members who don't care and continue to overeat, gain weight, and develop health issues. 
What's going on with them that they do not care? Thank well, you. Well, I think I don't think they don't care. I think they're addicts, and that you can't you can't make people care. You can't make people love you. You mm -hmm. can, there's nothing you can do. You've got to put on your oxygen mask first. You can't give from an empty cup. You can't make people care. They don't care about themselves. They don't care about their health because they're addicted. And this is most of the world, guys. It's like you know I think about that movie Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. I would call it Fat, Sick, and Addicted because people are addicted to animal products and processed food. Sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, and animal products, and you can't make it, you can't make people care, and they don't care, and it's very sad. But save yourself, and then be an example, and then maybe someday when they're fat enough and sick enough, they'll ask you what you're doing. Right. So, um, someone mentioned live a little while ago that um, they pointed out what you said about people saying that you're too thin now, yeah. that you've lost the weight. Yeah. She said that she's now being told by people that she knows that she's too skinny. Yeah. She's asking, how do you tell if you are too thin? Well, you know, um, if she wants to post her height and weight, we can look it up on a BMI chart. But the thing is, is if people are telling you you're too thin, you're probably actually just right. Um, if your BMI is under 16, you probably are too thin. But if it's like 18 or above, or I think mine's 19, you're probably fine. The thing is, is since three-fourths of our population is overweight or obese now, that is our worldview of what is normal. And so if you are not overweight or obese, you're 25% of the population, there's fewer of you, and you do look abnormal. And the only way that most people can get thin is with a heroin or a drug addiction or chemotherapy. No, Very few people could do it the way that we recommend doing it. And so you are an anomaly, and very often it's a status thing because they're still fat and they're jealous let's, let's face it I mean it's I have never known somebody who is as thin as me or thinner to tell me I'm too thin it's always it's and it's never been a man by the way I've never had a man tell me I'm too thin it's always been a woman and it's always been somebody heavier than me and usually somebody that's overweight so um, it, you know if you send me your stats send me a picture but my guess is if you're being told you're too thin you're just right but also when you change see see here's the thing Mary McDougal is it's like 17 pounds thinner than me and she's very thin but people don't go around like oh my god she's so thin because she's always been thin when you change then it's a big deal you know but if you've always been thin I know a lot of thin people have always been thin like my husband nobody ever says oh my god you're so thin he's always been thin right his whole family it's thin. a status thing yeah but if sure. you change then it's like wow well you got you know you look how great you are and, and it reminds them of their past dietary failures because most people want to lose weight and most people can't won't and never will and if they do they'll gain it back so hold your ground nice you can, and or come up you know depending on what kind of person you are you can come up with snappy answers or um, you can you know you, depending you don't have to really say anything but you could say Oh, uh, thank you for your concern, but I just had a complete physical and my doctor said my weight is perfectly proportional to my height or, or something like that. Or, you know, when somebody says, oh my God, you look anorexic, I could snap you like a twig. I'll say, gosh, thank you, because that's what I was going for. You know, um, um, or, or Dr. Goldhammer has told me to say, uh, I'm sorry that my personal appearance is so upsetting to you. So again, be who you are in the response. It can be clever, it could be witty, or it could be, you know, um, I mean, there is a slight chance that they're saying it out of concern, but most of the time it's out of jealousy, I gotta be honest, especially if it's from a female and if the female is heavier than you. Right. Do you want to address what's going on with your hand? Because a lot of comments Oh, okay, been... sorry, okay, well, I don't know. And um, yeah, I don't know. So, okay, th um, September, not September, October 18th, I woke up and this thumb was the size of Fred Flintstone, <laughs> and my palm was swollen and filled with fluid, and I can't, I couldn't bend my thumb, and I still can't bend my thumb. So I went to the hand surgeon, and he gave me oral steroids and pain medicine, because it was the second most painful thing I've ever had after my back, which I broke. It was even more painful than my knee. Took the oral steroids, six days, it went down. I still couldn't, I couldn't bend this joint, but I could bend this joint, and I'm talking about this hand. Two days off steroids, blew up again. Went to a different doctor, did the ultrasound, fluid filled. Another round of steroids and pain medicine, MRI, abnormal, something with the tendon. Um, they thought it was trigger thumb, but it's not because trigger thumb stays bent and mine doesn't bend at all. So then, uh, again, two days off the steroids, now even worse, I'm crying, I'm in pain. So now he injects it and he splints it and um, the swelling is down, the pain is a lot less, but still can't bend my thumbs. So we don't know yet. Uh, they've asked me to see a rheumatologist. I don't think I have autoimmune disease, but uh, they don't know what it is. So 
uh, hurts and uh, gotta wear this all the time. And that's why I can't answer your email because I cannot do the mouse with the left hand. I tried, it's really hard. So I could type like this, but it takes forever. So I'm kind of get in touch with me on the boards because then I could do voice to text. That's the best way on Facebook because that's the easiest way, so. Elizabeth Thanks. Bell asked live, how long do you have to push through the fatigue so that you actually have energy to prep foods and start moving? Well, I'm not sure what she means by the fatigue because you shouldn't be fatigued on this lifestyle. I mean, there often can be a detox, especially if you're giving up something like coffee or alcohol, stimulants and depressants. But you should be eating, if you're tired eating this way, you're probably not eating enough starch and probably not eating enough calories. You know, there can be myriad reasons for fatigue, just like bloating or headaches. And, and so are you saying that before you ate this way, you weren't fatigued? Most people actually have more energy when they eat this way. And if you can't do the food prep, then pay somebody to do it. You know, they have food delivery services now. There's one that's plant, I think it's called Plant Perfect. It's based on Dr. Esselstyn's meal plan. I mean, do that if you can't do it. Um, by the way, with, with this hand, I haven't been able to do meal prep either. So what I've been doing is go to Trader Joe's and I get the organic brown rice and the fire roasted bell peppers and um, onion. And I microwave it and I put a few drops of hot sauce on and we had it for dinner and Charles said, this is delicious because we never had it before. So make it easy, make it simple. Uh, you can buy things prepped with salt-free beans, uh, cooked grains, both in aseptic cartons and in the freezer section. It's not that hard to batch cook potatoes and sweet potatoes and, and buy fruit. You can, especially if you go to places like Costco, it's already cut up for you and it's often organic. So I don't know what she means by fatigue because you shouldn't be fatigued eating this way. You should feel great and have lots and lots of energy. Uh, are you getting to bed on time? Are you using stimulants? You know, I need more because you really should feel better, not worse. Sometimes there's a few days of detox to get off the sugar, when you're getting off the sugar and the other crap, but that should, you know, three to five days, you should be feeling pretty good if you're eating enough calories and eating enough starch. Okay, I think that about All right. wraps well, it up. that's it, guys. Hope to see you in South Carolina. We'll get those prizes fulfilled as soon as possible. Thanks so much for participating in last week's contest. It was kind of fun. It was a little crazy, I know. I don't think we'll be doing it that way, at least not that way of delivering prizes again. And thanks again to all the vendors. And thank you guys for watching episode 51 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body you so richly deserve. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.